We really came here because we wanted a good environment, a good healthy environment with healthy food for, for us and our kids. Mm -hmm. And they're quite young at the time, they were. Yeah, two and five. Two, two and five, yeah. yes. So I'd given up work while I was doing a bit of consultancy from home. And yes, um, we'd both grown up on farms too. Yeah. Um, so we were quite interested in getting back and developing a, as Gary called a self-reliant kind of lifestyle. Most of the menagerie now. <laughs> And we've been here for 20 years. Yeah. Mm. And when we came here, it was just a runoff block with scrub and um, used for cattle in the winter. So 20 acres actually came out to... Um... 120. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said to people, I've never been a revolutionary because I'm a democratic at heart. I believe that, that people should... Um, be able to work together and participate in decision making and you know we should work as a, as a group and democracy should be the way to go which is only part way there but I'm a deeply radical person in terms of I think our, we have to change at our roots in the true sense of the word radical at the root we have to change our whole approach and our whole way of life and I don't think revolutions do it they just change one lot of power group for another lot of power group they don't change the, our culture and the way we do things, you know, which requires everybody in that society to change. So that's why it's a cultural transformation that's required. We've gone back to thinking we need economic growth regardless. You know? We've gone back to thinking that population growth doesn't matter. You know? And yet, it, so that's why I think you know, the big elephant in the room that nobody ever talks about is that there's just too many people in the world. Mm. So how can you be sustainable when you're just totally overburdening the, the ecosystems. Yeah. The oil will run out, the financial system will get so overburdened with debt that it will collapse. Water will run out. Water's under great stress yes. at the moment. Lots of minerals will run out. Yeah, yeah so. and so we'll run out of lots of different things, not just mm. oil. And we're all going to be dead, everyone in this room will be dead in a hundred years. You know, everybody in the world right now will be dead in a hundred years. You know. So it's not about individuals, when they survive or die, they all die. It's about what goes on into the future, what, what way of life of the planet and people goes on into the future. So that's what we're sort of trying to, that's what sustainability should be about. And that's the other thing is that sort of where, well we think yeah, we are at the top of the ecosystem, we certainly are in terms of the way we, we draw the resources out of it. So we're the one who's most vulnerable. Yeah, but Any change that takes place, we're the, we're the vulnerable species. We're the expendable species. Yes. Right. Right. We mightn't like it. Right. All the microbes out there, all the grasses out there, all the trees out there, you know, they can survive without us. And, but we can't survive without them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that was quite heavy to come and do, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like so many people going onto land, first of all, we had the dream. Um, of what we wanted and uh, you know we want bush, we want a stream, we want a certain amount of land and then we set out looking for it. It's really important when you're looking for a place that there's lots of things you can change, you actually can grow trees, you can regrow forests but you can't change the climate and you can't change your basic soils, you can, you can improve the top soil and you can bring life back into it but there's certain things that you can't change so we looked at so what other things we can't change and try to get those right you can't suddenly produce water out of nothing. No, no, although you can regenerate streams by yes. planting forests. So we did a lot of planting of trees initially. 30, 40,000 trees we planted. Mm. And we did a lot of design work originally too. We sort of looked at a lot of different things and we talked to a lot of people. And anybody who put up with us, we'd talk to about what they'd done. And, <laughs> and, we, and we joined these groups like small farmers and farm forestry and tree crops, tree crops and biodynamics and soil and health. Soil and health, yeah, which is all really helpful. Yes. So anyway, sustainability. Sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> and well, unsustainability. It's, it's, you know, we drive a tractor and <laughs> two cars and <laughs> yeah. chainsaws and brush cutters and a four-wheel bike, so we're not exactly sustainable. Yeah, and there's lots of machinery because we are actually, I mean, 
Well, they've done, tried to do a lot for the environment in terms of naturally, in terms of regenerating that, putting a lot more forest back in, a lot more trees, and had a much more diverse um, farm, like with orchards and small animals and sheep and cattle and the whole works. Socially, it's still very primitive. It's just one family mm -hmm. on it. And so we need all sorts of labour saving devices like machines and, and that. So because of that, we, we do rely on, on machinery. And in fact, quite a lot of organic farming is just replacing chemical energy with mechanical energy. Mm -hmm. um, gives you healthier food, but there's quite a big difference between a healthy lifestyle and a sustainable one. Uh, well, we first planted in, well, 88, 89, 90. We wanted to have something in the, in the real world for our superannuation fund. So that's why we, we otherwise I wouldn't have planted Pinus Radiata. First, people helped me with the pruning initially and thinning, and then I had a mate who came each year. And each year in the winter, we would go up with our ladders and our pruning saws and, and loppers and we would philosophise about the world as we climbed these trees side by side and, and pruned them. And, and so we did that for many years. We're going to mill them probably within five years or five to ten years. We've got a, we've got a milling right now. And um, the problem is if, if I claim the... I've worked it out. If I claim the rights, if we claim the rights to it, if we don't replant in pine trees, then we probably have to pay because pine trees grow faster than natives. Therefore, they have more credits. And we want to retire it back into native. Yes. Which in the long term is obviously better. It's a more productive forest and it'll, it'll sequester much more carbon. But because it's not in the short term, pines grow more quickly. I mean, I don't know how these people calculate these things. Yeah, it's crazy really, isn't it? Because yeah. it'll, so it'll be permanently in forest. Yeah, then it's permanently, pine, permanently retired. You, you, you release know, full it forest. So anyway, so we probably won't claim the carbon credits. <laughs> I have actually found a lot of other trees as well. Yes. A lot of yeah. other species. We've got a lot of compressor species. We've got some natives. We planted some totras in Tawa. But um, technically, I'm allowed to cut down the totras because I planted them. Because they are actually a, a, a plantation. Yes. And not, not, not free growing. I don't know how they know the difference, but... This is coppicing. That's they originally thought, for, thought for that we might go into firewood, but it's um, uh, it's not a the it's sale. A good, not yeah. a good game to make money out of. No, but we need no. a lot because we use it for the wood stove and we need it for our fire anyway. Uh, so mm. we set up doing coppicing uh, along the track, which is really easy then because the trees are on the uphill side. We chop them down and then just use gravity, yeah, gravity to bring in. them down to the track. And, from, from when you cut it till you get it into the fireplace, it's a lot of handling. Well, I think we actually worked it out from the time you planted it too. It, it, yes. there's, so there's, but I mean, it's, it's still energy, energy-wise, it's a very good return. But it's uh, in terms of um, economically, there's people just don't pay enough for timber for for firewood. Mm -hmm. We planted too many gums, unfortunately, because I don't really like how big winds. But the birds have come in and dropped the seeds and the natives are all coming up, popping up all over the place. I mean, we did a lot of composting initially because we had to regenerate the soils. Now we just do sort of an autumn compost. And, um, and we did a lot of companion planting around the, in the orchard. Mm -hmm. And also we graze underneath with the kuni kuni pigs and there's chickens and ducks. And, and that combination of, of orchards of, of the, the fruit trees with the herbs and the small animals works really, really well. Mm. Because it's quite a diverse orchard system and it's got the pigs and the chooks in it as well, that we don't get much disease on the fruit trees there. And when we do, they recover quite quickly and it doesn't seem to affect the, the amount of fruit. So that was quite good. Yeah, we used to get yeah. a lot of black spot, didn't we? On, yes, uh, on, mainly on the, the newer varieties. Yeah, it was, it was. But over the years, it's just got less and less and less. Occasionally we still get a yeah, bit. Yeah, if you've got a bad year, year didn't we? Yeah. But the, mainly, if you've got the pigs will eat up all the all the um, windfall apples underneath, mm. and then the chooks will also have a good scratch around and, and eat up things too. So it's, it works And as the soil well, just becomes yeah. healthier, the trees just become healthier. And, yes. And then they can resist the, resist it, the fungi. So... So they don't get much treatment now. They get no. pretty well other yeah. than picking the fruit off them, which yeah. is cool. Yes. Because the animals re-manure and that keeps recycling. So it's a, it's a, 
Productivity is really the speed of recycling. The more things are recycled and the more complex the recycling systems, the higher the productivity. So the more you've got in there, the more diversity you've got in there, the more productivity you've got. Yes. Some of the things clearly were, were working because a couple of ones in terms of the health of the animals. We had an outbreak of facial eczema and people out here were killing their lambs in particular and their sheep and they putting putting up their misery. It was really, really severe. And I was keeping a good eye on them. My lambs that had down on the best pasture, a clean pasture, and I had the ewes up the top. And I noticed a couple of them looked like they had an eczema on the, you know, they get it on their faces. And they were the sheep that were going to be culled that year. And, and we used to do our own culling then and use them for dog meat. And so when we actually killed the animal later, we checked the livers, and the livers are perfect. So what was the, 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 the worst, the, the, the oldest, poorest mm. ewe got a touch of it, but still recovered, right? Mm. But when your best lambs are dying like a pulpy kidney, then you've got a very unhealthy system going on. And so that showed that we had progressed to a much healthier system. And the same thing happened when they had a TB outbreak here. They had a TB outbreak and, and every other herd around here had at least one reactor in the TB because the TB guy told me this. We were the only herd that didn't have a reactor in it. And yet mm. our cattle were closest to the possums and to the TB. You know, we had good healthy cattle, so they were not affected by it. And do you get your water, your drinking water yes. from the stream? From the spring flow. This is the really good flow from out of the hill. Okay. So it comes out as a natural spring out of the rock and it comes, comes down to the valley. So further up we tap it and then it's gravity fed down to the house. Really good water. Yeah. It's really interesting that life probably is a synergy between carbon and its ability to do these chains and rings and water. Because water is actually what allows all the processes to take place and they even think that water, the, the, the way water flows is actually allowed the, the, like the DNAs and the protein things to actually develop. And it's and it probably the synergy between water and carbon that actually made life possible. Mm. Well that's the most critical one because we actually can live without oil but we can't live without water. And as we, as we pollute it or as we degrade water, then we degrade the whole of the ecosystem. We make it that's so much more fragile and vulnerable. And water is uh, one thing that you can, one of the indicators of how unsustainable we really are. Because the rivers are those, they are the veins of the earth and, the, and, and the, all the complex life things take place around those waterways, you know, that's where everything takes place. And so that energises the water, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it energises it and oxygenates it. And yeah, I mean, clearly oxygenates it, even the scientists will tell you that. It increases the dissolved oxygen in the water. But it also energises it because of the spiralling pattern it sets up in it. And it's just the shape is such that the water naturally does its, its pulse, its figure of eight pulsing sort of dynamic. And you've got an outdoor bath here as well. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And we can set it up to circulate through the flow form with a pump goes on the bottom. So we heat it up and we circulate it all and we get the steam rising off here. We get the sound from here and I'll tell you what it's fantastic water to have a bath in when you've gone through the flow forms as well. It's really really nice. Yeah so that's the full Monty there. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's all the draft plan, plans and plans. Plan, plan, plans, lots of drafts. And and drawing up plans of the building. We wanted to use local materials and we finished up using a lot of macrocarpa, which there was plenty of around here. And for example, we built stone walls and we didn't want to import schist from central Otago when we could quite easily build grey wacky from here. And we wanted it to fit into the site. We'd done lots of plans of houses before on bits of paper, but when we came here, of course, the site was quite different. So we had to change things yeah. around considerably. Yeah, and that's yeah. just a cross section of the building, and that shows some of the passive design things here. This is a cross section. This is the ground here, and so that, and these things like these are what clear stray windows, which is what we've got just above us up here, and and they let um, the winter sun come into here and bounce off and sort of bring in both the light and the warmth, 
and, and in the summer when the sun's over the top you just get the indirect lighting and, mm. and then verandas do the same sort of thing up here and then we've got a very favourite yep. room, which is our nook in here, yeah, which has yeah. got a double brick wall around it. And in the winter time, it's as snug as one thing, and in the winter, in the summertime, it's really it's the cool. coolest place to be. So it's mm. really a great, really great. And we have a, a um, log fire in there and vent the hot air um, to each end of to the each house. End of the house from there. Yeah. So the, the brick sack is the thermal mess. Mm. So because this is a timber a timber house basically. And so that provides internal thermal mass to the house and moderates the temperature in that. And that works really well. And then we've got a, a, the kitchen wood range with a wet back and everything as well. So that even before we had the alternative power, we've got a gravity feed water supply from a spring, really good water for drinking. And if the power went off, we had the water, we had the wet back for hot water, we have a hot shower, we could cook, we could warm ourselves yeah. with no power. Every single square centimetre of roof base goes into the rainwater tank and um, we've got an easement That's right strong. from a stream which supplies mm. water to the house but also to the troughs and we've got dams for the stock as well and that so this was, this was quite an interesting there. idea where you hang a chain up and then you cover it with some chicken netting and then you mortar it up and it's called a cartoonery the shape a chain makes. And then you turn it up the other way. Yeah, and we use and, it for the framework of the yeah, cellar. Yeah, that's that cellar. So, and it, that's just the veranda poles. And so you just change the height or whatever you find with the length. So if it's one of this long or you want it that long, and the chain will just make the shape. Oh, wow. And then you put the chicken netting around it, and then you just put a bit of lime in your mortar so it sticks, and you just put your rubber gloves on and you do it up. It's very quick. Oh, yes. It's yeah. very quick and very easy to do. But then once we put the, the beams up, then we just put a bit of light sort of wire with netting and we just plastered the whole thing. Oh, that's to make a cellar. Yes. So you have some wooden beams in there as well? No, no, no it's, all, it's all plaster or it's all these beams or plaster. It's like, it's like a ferro cement with chicken netting in it. Mm -hmm. And it's a really efficient way of using a very small amount of material to enclose it. And it has a very good natural shell shape, which is really good and really strong. So the stronger the wind blows, the more solid it gets. Mm. And even with at the moment, we try to we are converting our farm our barn over to a farm stay, and so we're trying to use um, you know materials that are, haven't got chemicals like using macrocarpa wood again. And now, but everywhere you turn, I mean everything is designed on the sort of stuff you get off the shelf, which is all um, plastic and metals mm. and, and and straight lines. Everything's in modules of straight lines, you know. Yeah, we're just finishing off the um, dipping and then we're going to do the earth plastering. So we're going to earth plaster this rather than a conventional plaster. And that's an earth floor you're standing on there, which is not finished yet. Got another layer or two to go up yet. How many layers of clay is there? Uh, we're up to about the third or fourth. And there's another Two, two or three thinner layers. It gets thinner and thinner as you get up. We started off with about 100 mils and then about 50 to 60 and now we're down about 30 mils. Painting windows is a real drag but oil in you just slap the oil on and wipe it off the glass. Very easy to do. Those rafters are from, our, from the, the trees we milled um, and that tongue and groove is also you know, came off this probably. It's beautiful. Yeah, and it's all wall bats, that's our wall bats in there. That's, so it's all lined with wall bats. So all the, there's not going to be any mains power in here? No, this is all alternative power. But it's mainly lighting. Lighting and as I say, if people want to have the computer on and the plugs and the cooking and and it will be wood or gas. There'll be gas hob as well. And you've got the wet back on the gas on, on the cylinder on the, too. Yeah. It really warms up really quickly because it's got this nice sort of lift up through here. Flat ceiling is really bad for you. Particularly sleeping under a flat ceiling. So that's why we've got this lifted like this and that's why this like and, and, you know, and you get the sort of the different resonance from the different shapes. Why is it really bad for you? It's just well it's really hard to sort of pin down, but one of the things is that if you've got a square box, 
you get a lot of um, dead areas in it in terms of the air doesn't move properly and it sort of goes stale and it doesn't flow around properly and you collect dust in those corners a lot more um, so most sort of natural houses used to be built sort of either curves or rounds and domes or whatever you know. it's only because there's all this is industrially made that it goes into straight lines and things in there so these days round the windows now you've got to have this plastic stuff and metal flashings and, and tape with bitumen on them and things like that. But see, we made a, a compromised decision at the beginning because I wanted the farm stay to be consentable. So that everybody who comes and stays, I can say, you can build this. There's nothing in the rules that will stop you building this. I mean, I've had to do myself sign off our compost loo and our grey water system because I can't do that from a building consent point of view. And it's still going to have the tract underneath, and it's still got the hay underneath here. So it still has a hay shed and a tractor shed. Yeah. And the pigs sleep under here too. <laughs> Tell me a bit about the composting toilet. Uh, yeah, composting toilet is going to be actually using one of those wheelie bins. So it's very straightforward. You just um, have a chute that goes into that wheelie bin, and open the lid, put the chute down on it from the throne. And, um, and then you put some bit of um, shavings are the best, wood shavings are the best to go on it. Add that in every time, you do your thing. And we're going to be a bit discriminatory because um, the women's urine is going to go in because we need some moisture in it, but not too much. And we're going to have a men's urinal over here as well. And that's going to go into the grey water system and out there through the grey water system. And I am going to have a leachate um, thing I can undo on the bottom of each container to take any more, too much excess moisture and it goes out to the treatment system as well. That's, that's a, just a ferro cement, it's chicken netting with a, um, plaster on it, but it's a double one with cardboard in between to give it an insulation layer. Um, so it'll be fully sealed over, apart from the vents, to keep the warmth in as well. And it's washable, we can wash it out if we have to, we can hold things because it's concrete. Yeah. So all you have to do when you do it is you're going to lift the, up the chute a bit because um, it goes right down into the box. Put the lid back over it, wheel it out and take it away. Wheel another one in, well take the lid off, wheel another one in, drop your chute down again, all done. And you leave it like that to mature for a while and then you can add it to your, well you can add it to your other compost or you can add it around, around your trees like that in the shelter belt under the litter and that sort of thing. After six months? Yeah, after six months. Yeah, so that it's real, well mature. Yeah. And then we've got a big high flue, which is really good for sucking the air through. The higher the better. And we'll put one of those little spinning tops on it, the self spinning, you know. And we can also take the air from the room down into it to keep warmer air into it, because warmth is, uh, it needs, it generates its own warmth. And the worst time is a really cold, still day in winter. That's the time it might not properly um, extract the air. Mm -hmm. So we will have be able to put a, a little fan on the bottom of it, which we can turn on if we need to. Mm -hmm.